Welcome to Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study and our series on Genesis. You can find us at SeekingTruth.net. Please join us now for Seeking Truth with Sharon Doran. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our final study, Genesis chapter 48, 49, and 50. Today is the feast day of St. Joseph, March 19th, 2020. In 1870, Pope Pius IX proclaimed St. Joseph the patron saint of the Universal Catholic Church. And he said this, Pharaoh made Joseph the lord of his household and prince over all his possessions as Almighty God appointed Joseph, son of the patriarch Jacob, over all the land of Egypt to save grain for the people. So when the fullness of time was come and he was about to send on earth his only begotten son, the savior of the world, he chose another Joseph, of whom the first had been a type And he made him the Lord and the chief of his household and possessions, the guardian of his choicest treasures. We find that line also in the divine praises, my friend. Pope Pius IX realizes a typology between Joseph of the Old Testament, Joseph of Egypt, and Joseph of Bethlehem of the New Testament. And eight years before he died, he proclaimed St. Joseph of the New Testament to be the patron saint of the Universal Catholic Church. Makes perfect sense. He is the father of the beginning of the church on earth, the domestic holy family in a covenantal marriage with the mother of God, the husband of Mary, the immaculate conception, the foster father of God, Jesus Christ himself, the defender and protector of the holy family, the defender and protector of the holy family on earth, the church of almighty God. Other titles for Joseph of Bethlehem, he becomes Joseph of Nazareth. He will leave his homeland, his hometown of Bethlehem, and go to a safer place up north when Herod's son takes rule. He must flee his hometown of Bethlehem under the cover of night in the flight into Egypt to become an immigrant, Joseph the immigrant, Joseph the unemployed foreigner, But while in Egypt, Joseph must have remembered his namesake, Joseph, the patriarch and the highly favored son of Jacob. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son, said the prophet Hosea. God will call them out of Egypt. There are more titles for St. Joseph. St. Joseph most just. St. Joseph's sense of justice and righteousness outweighed his own ego his own sense of personal pain, his own need for retribution. This is a challenge for us when we think we have been wronged, either rightly or wrongly. Sometimes we think we've been wronged and we haven't been. St. Joseph most chaste is another title because he had what we call a Josephite marriage to Mary. Joseph will not touch the Ark of the New Covenant, Mary. Joseph, like Aaron's rod in the Old Testament, Joseph's rod will bloom with flowers of purity. St. Joseph is also called the mirror of patience. Why? He is waiting on God's word. He is beholding the mystery, but patiently waiting for the revelation of God's fullest plan. So he is titled St. Joseph, the mirror of patience. He reflects patience to the world, waiting on God's word, waiting on the unknown mystery. St. Joseph also is the model of obedience. He will listen and obey what was conveyed to him by angels in dreams. He is obedient. St. Joseph, the model of artisans. St. Joseph, the worker, but he developed his gifts and became a skillful craftsman, skilled in an art, in a craft. One that Joseph would teach to Jesus the dignity of human work, the art of creating, even though it was through Jesus that he, Joseph himself, was created. St. Joseph, another title, the illustrious son of David. He will be great. This is of Jesus, the angel told Mary. He will be called son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. So Joseph is from the line of King David as is Jesus from the line of King David. Both come from the royal line, King David, tribe of Judah. 
St. Joseph is also called the light of the patriarchs or the splendor of the patriarchs. Why? Because he's a model for those in positions of authority. Joseph, one of my favorite names for him, the terror of demons. Why? He, why is he called the terror of demons? Look at the snake under his feet and his rod of purity and his axe. Because in Revelation 12, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, that he might devour her child when she brought it forth. She brought forth a male child, one who would rule the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It will be St. Joseph's job, the terror of demons, to protect Mary and Jesus from the demons, especially Satan, who wants to devour him the moment he is born. So St. Joseph, the terror of demons. The protection of Mary and of Jesus would begin from conception forward. I love these old paintings of the scene of the visitation because immediately after Mary says, be it done unto me according to your word, she left with haste to the hill country of Judea. And these old paintings show that when she entered the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth, we see Joseph with Mary, Zechariah with Elizabeth. See the arrows in all these paintings. These paintings, it's the oral tradition of the early church that Joseph accompanied Mary with haste to the hill country to protect her, to protect the child within her womb, his child, his foster son, Jesus Christ. He goes with Mary to the visitation to the hills of Ancarim. Uh, I love I love these paintings, and I love seeing Joseph's presence at the scene of the visitation. We don't often think of it that way. It's wonderful. Joseph protects Mary and baby Jesus, embryo Jesus, from conception forward. Joseph continues to protect Jesus through adolescence, teaching him chastity and virtue and scripture to a human son that he will father. He gets lost when he's 12 years old. Think of Joseph, the protector, the defender, and and Jesus is lost. Three days they are looking for Jesus, and they find him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, his mother and father, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. For three days they looked for him. Joseph says nothing. In all the scriptures, Joseph remains silent, the silent strength. Jesus went down with his parents. He went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he was obedient to them. They are good parents. He is obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. That's because he had a good foster father, a human father named Joseph. When did St. Joseph die? Well, we know that John and Jesus both began their public ministries at age 30. That's the age of priesthood in the Old Testament. Jesus was six uh, months younger than John. John came first. We do not see Joseph in the scripture during the public ministry of Jesus Christ. For instance, there is no Saint Joseph at the wedding feast at Cana. There is no Saint Joseph at the passion of Jesus Christ. There is no Saint Joseph when Jesus entrusted Mary to St. John the Evangelist. There is no husband of Mary. There is no nephew of Mary because the relative John the Baptist has already been beheaded by Herod. With no family, Jesus assigns her to John the Evangelist. And most scholars assume that Joseph must have died before the public ministry of Jesus began. The faithful believe that too. Another title for St. Joseph is St. Joseph, the patron of a happy death. Can you imagine being surrounded on your deathbed, being comforted and prayed with, with both Mary and Jesus at your side. No wonder he had a happy death and is the patron of happy deaths. And we see many statuettes, stained glass windows, and paintings. Jesus must first complete his work of salvation, however. His name, Jesus, is given to him by Joseph, and it means God saves. Jesus must save by the power of his instrument of martyrdom, that is the cross. He must first complete that work of God uh, before he can open up a gateway back to the Father. He has to harrow Hades, he has to harrow Sheol, uh, preach to those imprisoned spirits, free them. Joseph could then be crowned a saint. Once 
Jesus had died on the cross, harrowed Haiti, the crowning of St. Joseph comes next in the artwork of the church. No one in the world claims to have the relics of Mary. No one in the world claims to have the relics of St. Joseph. We don't know if he was assumed or not, but no one claims to have his grave or his relics. So a lot of typology between Old Testament Joseph, the son of Jacob, and New Testament Joseph, the son of Jacob also. Both are sons of Jacob. Both Jesus and Joseph were sons of Jacob from the tribe of Judah and the house of King David. We know Old Testament Joseph is a son of Jacob. We know New Testament Joseph. It says in Matthew 1.16 that Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So both Josephs have a father named Jacob. Today, just today, March 19th, in response to the continued spread of the coronavirus, our Archbishop George Lucas asked Catholics throughout our archdiocese to invoke the intercession of St. Joseph all these titles today on his solemnity to protect, to defend us. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph. The typology of Joseph, son of Jacob, and Joseph, son of Jacob. One more thing Joseph was phenomenal at, both Josephs, was the virtue of chastity. Both Josephs have this virtue. You'll remember Chase Joseph rebuffed Potiphar's wife and was imprisoned indefinitely for it. In the divine praises, we say St. Joseph is titled Most Sacred Chaste Spouse of Mary. Saint, uh, Father Boniface Hicks wrote this, and I love this quote, about Joseph. He's a master of purity. It's able to see, to read in the language of the body, the mystery of God's presence hidden in the intimate center of another. A master of modesty does not exploit this mystery, nor expose this mystery, nor run away from this mystery, but rather veils the mystery with his love. Isn't that a beautiful description of the chastity of Joseph? He continues, in the end, St. Joseph both sees and veils the mystery of God's spousal love for mankind expressed in the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But it took an angel to help Joseph understand this and to have the courage to accept the task. We know that in Matthew 1.18, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So it did take an angel to help Joseph understand this and to have courage to accept this great task. She will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We know that prophet is Isaiah in chapter 7. When Joseph spoke, woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. That shows his obedience. He listened to the angel and did what the angel said. He took his wife but knew her not until she had born a son and he called his name Jesus. God saves. Joseph must protect and defend the Son of God so that he can save God's people. Joseph must constantly watch over Jesus as God's plan is going to be accomplished through Jesus. This is no small task for Joseph. If Joseph doesn't save him, then Jesus can't save us. This Joseph too in the Old Testament is saving God's people. All must come to Old Testament Joseph of Egypt for the bread of life. Joseph was protecting the salvation of the entire world. Both Josephs are protecting the bread of life for the salvation of the world. The survival of the human family is in Joseph's hands. The survival of the human family is in New Testament Joseph's hands as well. Old Testament Joseph protects the life of the entire world. New Testament Joseph, as well, protects the bread of life for the entire world. 
Pope Pius in 1870 proclaimed St. Joseph the universal patron of the Catholic Church. He realized the typology between the two Josephs, Old Testament and New. He said Pharaoh made Joseph the lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. And as Almighty God appointed Joseph, son of the patriarch Jacob, over all the land of Egypt to save grain for the people. So when the fullness of time had come and God was about to send on earth his only begotten son, the savior of the world, he chose another Joseph of whom the first had been a type, a typology. And he made him the Lord and chief of his household and possessions, the guardian of his choicest treasures. And my friends, his choicest treasures were Mary and Jesus and Joseph is put in charge of them. So we see a lot of typology between the Joseph of Egypt and the Joseph of Bethlehem. And only eight years after this proclamation, Pope Pius IX would die, leaving St. Joseph, the patron of the Universal Catholic Church. Um, more typology. Dreamers. Both are dreamers. Like the dreamer Joseph in the New Testament, the dreamer Joseph of the Old Testament. He had to dream and then he had to interpret what dreams meant. Both Josephs had to do this. Joseph in the New Testament has four dreams. His first one, Joseph is told not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife because she has conceived by the Holy Spirit. His second dream in Matthew 2.13 where Joseph is warned to leave Bethlehem and flee to Egypt. His third dream, Matthew 2, 19 to 20, while in Egypt, Joseph is told that it is safe to return to Israel. And in his fourth dream, Matthew 2, 22, because he had been warned in a dream, he departed for the region of Galilee instead of going to Judea. So he will move from Bethlehem to the Galilean region of Nazareth. Joseph in the Old Testament saw the she's bow down before him, the 12 brothers bowing down before him. He saw the stars and the sun, the moon bow to him. He's thrown into prison, remember, and the cupbearer and the baker are imprisoned with him. And one night they both have very upsetting dreams. And Joseph says, do not the interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, I pray you. He knows the power to interpret dreams comes from God of Israel. The first, the cupbearer, tells his dream. And Joseph tells him that within three days, Pharaoh will lift your head up and restore you to your office. You shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his butler. When the chief baker saw the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were on my head three cake baskets, three bread baskets, and in the uppermost basket were all sorts of baked bread for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on top of my head. And Joseph answered, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. And thus the baker was impaled. Joseph could interpret dreams by the power of God, but the cupbearer did not remember Joseph until two years later when Pharaoh had two dreams that no one in all of Egypt could interpret. When no one could interpret Pharaoh's dream, the cupbearer remembered Joseph in prison and told the Pharaoh about him. Pharaoh sent for the young Hebrew from prison and relayed his dreams to Joseph. He told about the grain and the cattle and Joseph knew the interpretation of the dream. Seven robust years will be followed by seven years of great famine. The Pharaoh was impressed with Joseph and his, his knowledge of the dreams, his leadership skills, and he makes him viceroy, governor, second in command in all of Egypt. He will be his right-hand man and all must go through Joseph for the bread of life. Seven days ago, we couldn't imagine anything remotely close to a seven-year famine. But on March 11, the World Health Organization publicly characterized COVID-19 as a pandemic. A pandemic is a global outbreak of disease, and pandemics happen when a new virus emerges to infect people and can spread between people sustainably. Because there's little to no pre-existing immunity against the new virus, it spreads worldwide. 
On March 13, 2020, Donald Trump, the President of the United States, declared the COVID-19 outbreak a national emergency, and immediately people started scrambling for food. We began to feel a tiny bit more of understanding for this Genesis book that we've been reading. Famine in the land, we'd go to the grocery stores and the shelves would be empty, no meat, no eggs, no bread, no toilet tissue. People really were stocking up on that. Uh, President Trump tweeted, I ask all Americans to band together and support your neighbors by not hoarding unnecessary amounts of food and essentials. Together we will stay strong and overcome this challenge. Yet people still wiped out grocery shelves, leaving nothing for those behind them. Worse than Christmas, worse than holidays. The corona outbreak has affected all of us, this tiny, tiny, tiny little microbe. God has allowed it. The sovereign God of the universe has allowed this microbe. Just as God allowed a worldwide famine in the time of Joseph, God has allowed a worldwide pandemic in our lifetime. But how many times did we hear this this year? We know that in everything, God works for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. We remember last week the self-revelation of Joseph, his truest identity to his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, come near me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. (laughs) Jacob got reunited with his son, Joseph, what seemed an impossibility but we also learned in Genesis that all things are possible with God. He has given with his family, his grandchildren, all his family, the best land, the land of Goshen in the Nile Delta River region. In Genesis 48, after this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, we remember back to Genesis chapter 41, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the same age Jesus was, the same age John the Baptist was. Um, Before the year of famine came, Joseph had two sons from Aseneth, the daughter of Potiphera. Joseph called the firstborn Manasseh, which means God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. I have forgotten my father's house. The second, he named Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Manasseh and Ephraim. Joseph is standing there now with his sons. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and he sat up in bed. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine, says Jacob. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, says Jacob, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. And the offspring born to you after them, Joseph, shall be yours. And they shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. For when I came from Padan, Rachel, to my sorrow, died in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrathah. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrathah. Ephrathah is the old name for Bethlehem. We remember Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin and was buried there on the roadside. Her tomb is there to this day. When Israel saw Joseph's two sons, he said, who are these? And Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me. I pray you that I might bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see Who does that remind you of? His eyes were dim with age so that he could not see. He's a blind old man like his own father, Isaac. What comes around goes around. Blind Isaac and Jacob. You remember how he stole the blessing, deceiving his father Isaac in Genesis chapter 27. Now the eyes of Jacob, Israel, were dim with age that he could not see. Joseph brought them near to him and he kissed them and he embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face. And lo, God has let me see your children also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Joseph is submitting to the greater. The lesser is blessed by the greater. Jacob, his father, he is submitting himself, bowing in obeisance to his father to receive the blessing. 
Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near to him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand upon the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. You know the right hand is the blessing hand of the father. Jacob blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has led me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. I think that's the angel he wrestled with that night. Bless the lads and in them let my name be perpetuated and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. He took his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not so my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. And his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he. Just as Jacob, the younger brother was greater than Esau. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day saying, by you Israel will pronounce blessings saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Jacob put Ephraim before Manasseh. Again, the second born gets the blessing of the father as we've seen so many times in Genesis. Ephraim was the second son of Joseph and Aseneth. You will remember Aseneth, the woman who Pharaoh gave to Joseph as a wife, the daughter of Potipharah, Potiphar's wife, and possibly the daughter and product of Dinah's rape by Shechem. Ephraim was born in Egypt before the arrival of the children of Israel from Cana. Ephraim was the will be the ancestor of Joshua, the great Joshua, son of Nun, successor of Moses, the leader of the Israelite tribes in the conquest of Cana after Moses. Also from the tribe of Ephraim came King Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel after the divide of the kingdom. Solomon rested with his fathers. We hear this in Sirach chapter 47. He left behind him one of his sons, amply in folly and lacking in understanding, Rehoboam, whose policy caused the people to revolt. And Jeroboam, the son of Nabot, who caused Israel to sin and gave to Ephraim a sinful way. Their sins became exceedingly many as to remove them from their land, for they sought out every sort of wickedness till vengeance came upon them. Now, my friends, when I'm studying Ephraim, I like to go to the prophet Hosea, but there are so many references to Ephraim in this book. I will only read you one. They're all mostly negative. Um, Ephraim is a cake not turned. Ephraim is like a dove, silly, without sense. Uh, a wild ass wandering alone, Ephraim has hired lovers. Uh, Ephraim's glory will fade like a bird. Ephraim will be put to shame, etc., etc. But chapter 11 of Hosea, I love this. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma, how can I treat you like Zebulim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not excuse my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come to destroy. So Jacob's blessing is on Ephraim. Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope, which I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Like he gave Joseph the special coat, he's giving Joseph the special mountain that he conquered with his own hand. Um, There is an art museum in New York City on the Upper East Side of Manhattan called the Frick Collection, and they bring in... um, 
collections. It, it's uh, industrialist Henry Clay Frick. Uh, they bring in extraordinary temporary collections, and one that was recently there, just two years ago, was uh, a collection of Jacob and his 12 sons' paintings by Zerbaran. Um, they're originally housed in the Auckland Castle in uh, County Durham in England, but this Spanish Baroque master, Francisco de Zerbaran, who painted these in 1640s, made 13 paintings of Jacob and the 12 Old Testament patriarchs, his sons, the tribes of Israel. Uh, there they are in their original setting, but they were brought to um, the Frick and on display. This artist uh, was born in 1598, and he made for a name for himself in painting religious art um, with deep mysticism, great visual impact. He uh, was an artist at the time of the Counter-Reformation, dying in Madrid, Spain in 1664. This is his self-portrait. He portrays himself here as St. Luke, the artist with a palette of paint in his hand. Uh, this is one of his famous paintings. I've used this many times, the Lamb of God, Agnus Dei, as well as the Immaculate Conception that he did that hangs in the Prada as well as these uh, well-known paintings of St. Francis in meditation. And you can see his great uh, work with color. In fact, they called him the Spanish Caravaggio for good reason, because he could use light playing on dark um, in very intimate spaces. And he did many of St. Francis. But he painted these 12 tribes of Israel. They were displayed together. And I'm going to, as I go through the blessing of Jacob over each of his sons, you'll see the painting that corresponds. So this is Jacob, the old man, the patriarch, and his 12 sons, the 12 tribes of the old Israel, Reuben, Gad, Naphtali, and Joseph, Zebulon, Asher, Issachar, and Dan, Benjamin, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. You know they came by four different wives. But when he blesses his son for the final time, he calls them together and he says, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the days to come. Assemble and hear, O sons of Jacob, and hearken to Israel, your father. Reuben, starting with Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn son, my might, and the first fruit of my strength, preeminent in pride and preeminent in power. You would think that sounds strong and good. He's the firstborn son. He should get the blessing and the birthright. But it goes on in verse 4 to say, Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. You went up to my couch. We saw that when he slept with Bilhah and made a power play for his father's dynasty. He will not get the blessing of the firstborn. Next, Simeon and Levi are brothers, weapons of violence, their swords. You'll remember when they destroyed the entire town of Shechem, made the men get circumcised, and then killed the whole city to defend the honor of their sister Dinah, who was raped by Shechem. O oh, my soul, come not unto their counsel. O oh, my spirit, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they slay men, and in their wantonness they hamstring oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now it's Judah, Lion of Judah, Jacob's fourth son by Leah. And look at, this is where Jesus will come from. This is where King David will come from. Judah, it's a long blessing. He gets the blessing. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff but from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and to, who, to him shall be the obedience of the people. Binding his foal to the vine and his ass's colt to the choicest vine, he washes his garments in wine and his vestures in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. Judah, Lion of Judah, Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Zebulon 
shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be at Sidon. You see the water in the background. We know Sidon is, the, is, is, is far north. Issachar is a strong ass crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, so he bowed his shoulder to the bear and became a slave at forced labor. That's Issachar. Dan. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's hill so that the rider falls backward. I will wait for thy salvation, O Lord. How about Gad? Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. And what of Asher? Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali? Naphtali is a hind let loose that bears comely fawns. And what about Joseph? Joseph in the coat of many colors. Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob from his beloved wife, Rachel. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers fiercely attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him sorely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. By the God of your Father who will help you. By God Almighty who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above. Blessings of the deep that crouch beneath. Blessings of the breast and blessings of the womb. The blessings of your Father are mighty beyond the blessings of the eternal mountains. The bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was separated from his brothers. Joseph gets a phenomenal blessing. Benjamin, his brother, also the son of Rachel, his love. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. All of these, all of these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what the father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with a blessing suitable to him. And then he charged them and he said to them, I am gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Cana, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. You will remember that cave back from Genesis chapter 23. It was the first piece of the Holy Land bought by Abraham. Uh, he bought it from Ephraim the Hittite, and Ephraim said, you can have it, you can have it to bury your wife, and Abraham insisted. He wanted to purchase it fair and square. He paid top dollar, 400 pieces of silver. You'll remember Genesis 23. And there Abraham buried his wife, Sarah, and there they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, and there I, Jacob, buried my first wife, Leah, the field and the cave that is in it were purchased from the Hittites. It is now Machpelah, it's in Hebron. Uh, King Herod built over it a grand, like a temple, like uh, one of the most sacred places in the Holy Land to visit, the, the cave, the burial place of the patriarchs. In 1976, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Herzog, uh, succeeded in having Abraham's purchase of the cave of Machpelah entered as a United Nations document. So they want, uh, they, they never forgot that that land was bought outright, fair and square from the Hittites. When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew up his feet into his bed. He breathed his last. Our hero Jacob breathed his last and was gathered unto his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face he wept over him and he kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it. That's a big number in the Bible, 40. Forty days were required for the embalming of Israel. And so are many required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him for 70 days. The Egyptians wept because he is the son of their hero, Joseph. 
And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of the Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die in my tomb, which I have hewn out for myself in the land of Cana. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, let me go, I pray you, and bury my father, and then I will return. You know, we don't know if Pharaoh will want to let him go because Joseph is very important to Egypt. He's second in command. He's his viceroy. He's his right arm man. But Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father as he made you swear. This is the trust that Pharaoh has in Joseph, that he's true to his word, that he will return. So Joseph went up to bury his father. He went up with all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his own household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the household of Joseph. This is quite an entourage, quite a funeral procession for the patriarch of Israel. So Joseph went up to bury his father, his brothers, his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there they went up, both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company a great funeral procession. And when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation. They made mourning for Joseph's father for another seven days, a perfection of sorrowing, weeping, mourning. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Cana. They buried him in the cave at the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham had brought from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up to bury his father. And when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us now and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, forgive, I pray you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now we pray you, forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. So the brothers get scared. They're afraid Joseph will renege on his forgiveness now that Jacob's dead. They make up a plan again, a plot, a, a plan of deception. They tell this to Joseph, the dad said this. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him. And they said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? That's a rhetorical question. Fear not, for am I, Joseph, in the place of God? Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Joseph is saying, who am I to judge? Pope Francis got in so much flack for saying that. But Joseph says the same thing. Fear not, for am I in the place of God? I cannot judge you. Only God can judge you. Only God can judge the full intent of your heart. Jesus is the judge, not Joseph. Jesus is the judge. As we know from John chapter 5, the Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Jesus, by his obedience and his perfection of sacrifice on the cross, has won the right to be the judge. None of us, none of us are the judge. Only Jesus he knows the fullness of the heart. He knows how he made you. He knows how he created you. He knows how he made your children. He knows everything that we presume to know and don't. So who am I to judge, says Joseph? Fear not, for I am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he reassured them and he comforted them. So Joseph's the real deal. He will leave the judgment to God. He will comfort them. He will care for them. Even after what they did to him. Joseph dwelt in Egypt. He and, in, he and his father's house. Joseph lived to be 110 years old. 
Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born upon Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land where he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath of the sons of Israel, saying, God will visit you. You will carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Jacob came safely to the city. Oh, uh, okay. I'm going back here to Genesis 33. We've ended. That's the end of Genesis. But Joseph says, bring my bones back. Bring my bones back. Um, So we remember in Genesis 33, there was another piece of land that was purchased in the Holy Land that was purchased with money. And it was in Genesis chapter 33, Jacob had come safely to Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan on his way to Padan Aram. He camped there in the city with Hamar and he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he pitched his tent. There he erected an altar. He called it El El Ola Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. He purchased the land. He built an altar there. And this is where Joseph will be buried. We're told in Joshua chapter 24, 32, that Joseph's Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for 100 pieces of silver from the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. So that land purchased in Genesis 33 becomes Joseph's burial place in the promised land. It's still there to this day. Joseph's tomb can be found in Shechem. Shechem is in Nablus, which is in the West Bank. Uh, It's in the same area, very near to Jacob's well, where Jacob fell in love with Joseph's mother, Rachel, and they kissed at the well and he wept. Uh, There now over the well is a church of Jacob's well. The keeper of the church is Father Justinus. He's the keeper of Jacob's well. He has survived numerous attempts on his life by Israeli settlers. The man before him, the priest, uh, became before him became a martyr in the Greek Orthodox faith. He was martyred there. His grave is there. He was martyred there at the well, Jacob's well. Father Justinius there standing by his grave. His name now is Saint Philomenus. He's a new martyr. He died at the hands of extremist Jewish Zionists who massacred him with an axe in the evening while he was performing evening vespers at the well of Jacob, where he lived as the loyal guardian of the holy places. Um, And Steve and I were lucky enough twice to visit this place and to be with the new caretaker, Father Justinus. He's not new. He's been there many years. But he's he's an iconographer, an icon writer, and he cares for the church at Jacob's Well. Uh, he took us to drink from Jacob's Well, the ice-cold water. We, we, he, he brought water up for us. He, he paints icons during the day, writes icons. He fills little jars up with water from the well and seals them with wax from a candle. That's what he's doing there. The Greek Orthodox call this the Church of St. Fotina. You know why. They have a relic, the forehead of St. Fotina, in a reliquarium there. Uh, You go down the stairs to the well. It's the same well where Jesus met the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman named Fotina. Uh, She had come at high noon to draw water. She was a sinful woman. She had had five husbands, the one she's with now, the sixth is in her husband. He wants to give her something. He wants to give her living water from the well. And she asks, are you greater than our father Jacob? Well, yes, he was. He's the son of Jacob. Jesus is the son of Judah from the fourth son, Judah of Jacob and Leah. And yes, Jesus was greater than her father Jacob, whose well this was. Jacob, uh, Jesus wants to give her living water water of the Holy Spirit from the well. You remember when his disciples came back, they had gone into town to get something to eat. And Jesus said to them, I have food to eat, which you know nothing about. Uh, My friends, 
from the beginning of Genesis, he wanted us to eat from the tree of life, which was Jesus in disguise. He was in the middle of the garden all along. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of all the nations. And now we chose the other tree, but he wants us to eat from the tree of life. And right now in our church, for the first time ever in our lifetimes, we're not being allowed to eat from the tree of life. Eucharist, because of the coronavirus, is, is not being offered in our archdiocese. So we do not have the food, the bread of life from the tree of life that is Jesus. And so I want to remind you in these times of day verbum number 21, where Pope Paul VI told us that the church has always venerated the divine scriptures just as she venerates the body of the Lord, since especially in the sacred liturgy, she unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table of both God's word and Christ's body. We can't have Christ's body right now, but you have God's word. You have a Bible in your hand. You have Jesus, the word, the living word of God with you at all times. The church has always maintained and continues to do so that together with sacred tradition as the supreme rule of faith, since as inspired by God and committed once and for all to writing, they impart the word of God himself without change and make the voice of the Holy Spirit resound in the words of the prophets and the apostles. Therefore, like the Christian religion itself, all the preaching of the church must be nourished and regulated by sacred scripture. For in the sacred books, the Father who is in heaven meets his children with great love and speaks with them. And the force and the power in the word of God is so great that it stands as the support and the energy of the church, the strength of the faith for her sons, the food of the soul, and the pure and everlasting source of spiritual life. Consequently, these words are perfectly applicable to sacred scripture for the word of God is living and active. It has the power to build you up and to give you your heritage among all those who are sanctified. So my friends, in these days ahead, when you don't have Jesus in the Eucharist, keep your Bible near your heart. Keep the word of God alive in your heart is Jesus. I'm so glad you've internalized it. I'm so glad you've studied it this year. And, and we've been doing this now for 10 years. This is our 10-year anniversary, and I'm sitting here talking to nobody tonight. I'm recording with Steve, and there's no one here because of the coronavirus. But I want to encourage you, keep the Word of God alive in your heart. It's Jesus. You have him even when you can't get to Eucharist. Keep reading the Word. Keep studying the Word. Keep living the Word. It's so precious. It's Jesus. And, and he's so glad that we care enough to be in his Word, to read his love letter to us. So I just want to encourage you that we are united in the Word of God. It's living. It's active. And it will be our life source. It will get us through to that day when we can one day participate again in the great wedding feast of the Lamb of God. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study. For more information, please go to seekingtruth.net.